All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, today we're going to watch Nerd Robot again, this time with the video Hinduism and Islam, a comparison. Last time we checked out Nerd Robot, it was about the three so-called Abrahamic faiths. It was about Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. However, today it is a direct comparison between Islam, monotheism, and Hinduism, which is perceived as polytheism. Moreover, we heard it over and over again later lately in the news that there is a lot of tension between Muslims and Hindus in India. Guys, before we start the video, if you enjoy the content, leave me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out the links in the description box to support this channel. We have merch and much, much more. All right, with no further ado, let's have a look. Hey there, thanks for tuning in. You folks seem to really appreciate that Judaism versus Christianity versus Islam video we exactly. did a while back, so I thought, really good. why not explore a bit more? Today, we're going to dive into Hinduism versus Islam. This isn't about stirring up debates, it's just an honest comparison using clear and concise infographics to highlight key aspects and differences between the two. Yeah, sure, we're gonna take his word for it, but ultimately discussion is of course welcomed for the YouTube algorithm, but beyond that as well, we need to open up the discussion between Muslims and Hindus. Why else would we make such videos? As always, I'm just providing the info. What you take away from it is up to you. So if you're curious about these two unique faiths, stick around, let's dive into it. Hinduism, tracing its roots back to around 3000 BC, represents a broad spectrum of beliefs and practices Amongst evolved over religions. millennia, while Islam, founded in 610 AD, presents a more uniform set of beliefs and practices informed by the Quran and the life of the Prophet Muhammad. The time the difference under Yes, he's absolutely correct here in saying that Hinduism is essentially a compilation of different belief systems. Hinduism is a terminology that has been coined by the British during the colonization period. So there is no real Hinduism per se. It is not one religion. There are many different belief systems that then got labeled by the Westerners as an ism. With Islam, on the other hand, he is absolutely correct here. It is much more uniform. Pins the extensive sure. theological and philosophical complexity found in Hinduism as compared to the comparatively recent but more streamlined structure of Islam. Hinduism's Trimurti, consisting of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, corresponds to cosmic functions of creation, preservation, and destruction. On the other hand, Islam practices strict- I have to interrupt it yet again here because it's so interesting to see that we do have a trinity within Hinduism. When I was a Christian, Christian teachers would tell me that the trinity is so unique. We only find it in Christianity and this is why Christianity is true. If you look at other religions, ultimately they're all pointing towards a unity. Even within Hinduism, they would claim, even within Buddhism and of course within Islam, people are pointing towards a unity. But it is only Christianity that points towards a trinity trinity and therefore it must be right. But look at this, it is of course not correct. Even in Hinduism and many, many other religions for that matter, you do have a trinity. Monotheism, with all these functions combined in Allah, demonstrating a clear contrast in the conceptualization of divine power. In Hinduism, Manu and Shatarupa are the first humans created and guided by Brahma. The Islamic tradition parallels this narrative with Adam and Hawa, created and guided by Allah. Both narratives set forth foundational ideas about human responsibility, divine interaction, and morality in their respective traditions. Which, by the way, sometimes people get discouraged when they find similar stories in other religions. And then they say, oh, now I'm questioning Islam. Is it really correct? We can see a similar story in Hinduism. Guys, all religions have half-truths. We believe that Islam is the full truth. We believe that Islam comes with a complete revelation. However, that does not mean that there are no truths at all in other religions. For example, if we look into Christianity, they're talking about Adam and Eve as well. They're talking about the prophets too. So we say, yes, those things are correct. However, those religions deviated. This is the Islamic perspective. And therefore, if we see in Hinduism that there is a male and a female, the first human beings, we should not get discouraged. Quite the opposite, we should get reaffirmed that this story has been transmitted throughout the ages. Action and morality in their respective traditions. The Vedas form the oldest and most revered texts in Hinduism, presenting a vast array of hymns, rituals, and philosophical discourses. In contrast, the Quran, revered by Muslims as the word of God, provides a singular comprehensive guide for all aspects of life, social, political, and Absolutely. spiritual. 
Exactly right. So he said it yet again. Islam is the whole package. It comes with a teaching for every aspect of life. And moreover, it is one single book. This is why it stands out. This is why it is so powerful. Most other faith traditions are compilations of different books, different authors, anonymous authors. Sometimes people do not know where those texts came from. Not in Islam. We have one book. The Mandir in Hinduism serves not only as a place of worship, but also a community center where various cultural and social activities take place. Similarly, the mosque in Islam functions as both a place of worship and a community center reflecting shared communal values despite their architectural and ritualistic differences. The Pujari in Hinduism and the Imam in Islam both serve as religious leaders. They guide their communities through rituals, prayers, and interpretations of scriptures. Their roles underline the universal need for spiritual guidance across diverse religious traditions. Sure. Puja yeah, in Hinduism religion. typically involves offerings to deities and can vary greatly in complexity, reflecting the myriad of local traditions. Salak in Islam is a fixed set of physical postures and Quranic recitations done at specific times each day, showcasing a rigid structure aimed at regular connection with the divine. Okay, this was a little bit vague here. The main difference is, of course, that in the Hindu prayer or whatever you want to call it, they said that they are worshipping different deities. And in Islam, for the thousandth time, we are worshipping one God alone. So he spoke about the rigidity that you find in Salah, that you have to do it five times per day. There's a certain way of doing it, a certain ritual, so on and so forth. However, he failed to mention the most important part here is that within Islam, you're praying to one God. God alone. This is the true distinction here. We're talking about monotheism and polytheism. We are not making any offerings to deities. Namaste in Hindu tradition is a respectful greeting which translates to, I bow to the divine in you. In contrast, Assalamu Alaikum in Islamic tradition translates to, peace be upon you. Both greetings reflect their respective traditions emphasis on respect and peace in interpersonal relations. Yeah, kind of. Namaste, I bow to the divine within you, of course, implies that there is a certain divinity within human beings. And this is again where they differ. Islam does not believe in that type of divinity within human beings. However, within Hinduism, essentially everything is an expression of God. It is very similar to pantheism. Therefore, the divinity is found within people. And this is why the greetings, namaste, and salamu alaikum couldn't be any more different. Salamu alaikum simply means peace be with you. This is what Jesus said as well to his followers and to the people around him. It is a greeting of peace. It is not acknowledging the divinity within people. Hinduism has approximately 1.2 billion followers, predominantly in India and Nepal, reflecting a strong cultural and regional concentration. Exactly. Islam, with about 2 billion followers, is more globally dispersed indicating its wide-scale acceptance and adaptability across different cultures and regions. Sure. The largest concentration of Hindus is in India, whereas Indonesia is home to the largest Muslim population. Exactly. These geographical concentrations highlight how specific historical, political, and cultural contexts have shaped the development and practices of these religions. Yes, absolutely correct. This displays when culture gets traded off for true religion ultimately. Most Hindus, as they said, are Indian. However, with Islam, an Arabic religion, people would assume that the majority of Muslims must be Arab. However, the worldwide percentage of Arabs in the Muslim world right now is only around 15%. This, of course, confirms the claim of Islam that Islam came for the whole world. And there you have it. Indonesian people are the majority of Muslims nowadays. The same cannot be said about Hinduism or Buddhism, which is extremely cultural as well, or even Christianity. Varanasi in India, considered the spiritual capital of Hinduism, hosts rituals like the Ganga Arti and cremations, which hold significant spiritual meaning. Similarly, Mecca in Saudi Arabia, the holiest city in Islam, hosts the annual pilgrimage, the Hajj. Both cities embody the deep historical, spiritual, and emotional ties of their respective followers. Diwali, celebrated by Hindus as a festival of lights symbolizing the victory of light over darkness, contrasts with Eid al-Adha in Islam, which commemorates the prophet Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son in obedience to God's command. Despite these different underlying themes, both festivals bring joy unity and reinforce shared values among their respective communities through acts of charity, communal prayers, 
feasts and family gatherings. Yeah, but ultimately they couldn't be more different, right? And guys, no hate here. However, in my comment section, I get many, many comments from Hindus claiming how evil we Muslims are because we slaughter the cows. In Hindu belief, Svarga is a temporary heaven-like realm attained by righteous souls before reincarnation. Islam's Jannah, however, is a permanent paradise granted to the righteous in the afterlife. While both concepts encourage ethical living, they represent different views on the soul's ultimate destiny. Sure. Naraka, according to Hinduism, is a realm ablaze with red fire, where souls undergo suffering and purification for their sins and are ultimately destined for rebirth. Conversely, Jahannam in Islam is a dark Jahannam. realm engulfed in black-colored fire, serving as a place of eternal punishment for the wicked. Hinduism describes Rakshasas as powerful demonic beings disrupting cosmic order somewhat akin to the Islamic concept of shaitan who are devils leading humans astray. Both symbolize forces okay. of chaos and evil. Ravana, a demon king in Hindu epics, embodies the force of ego and desire while Iblis in Islam represents defiance and pride. Both characters serve as cautionary figures against straying from righteousness. Bhutas in Hindu mythology, spirits of the dead, and jinn in Islamic belief, supernatural creatures created from smokeless fire, represent entities from unseen worlds, showing shared recognition of a reality beyond human perception. Right, yeah, we don't believe that they're deceased people. We don't believe that there is such a realm where people become ghosts. In Hinduism, celestial beings known as devas who serve the divine order are often compared to malaika or angels in Islam, both being intermediaries between God and humans. They symbolize okay. the constant cosmic order in both religions, highlighting the belief in a structured universe overseen by divine powers. Vidyadari, the celestial nymphs of Hinduism, also known as Apsaras, oh, are depicted as ethereal beings associated with beauty and nature, that is often interesting. involved in interactions with humans. Their counterparts in Islam, the Huri, are beautiful beings promised to the righteous in the afterlife. Mm. These beings symbolize reward and virtue, reflecting each religion's emphasis on righteousness and piety. Really the legendary creature Garuda in Hinduism is a bird-like deity, often serving as a mount to Lord Vishnu and symbolizing power and nobility. In contrast, Barak from Islamic tradition is a miraculous steed that transported the Prophet Muhammad during his night journey, symbolizing divine intervention and spiritual ascension. Right. Both these beings highlight the recurring theme of divine assistance and spiritual journeying in both religions. King Ashoka, remembered for his rule of righteousness in Hindu history, mirrors the esteem for Sultan Mehmed II in Islamic history, known for his strategic conquest of Constantinople. Both rulers left lasting impacts on their civilizations, embodying the ideal of just and powerful leadership right. in both cultures. Yeah, this is not really theological now, it's more political. Baji Rao I, Same. recognized as a remarkable military leader in Hindu history, and Khalid bin al-Walid, revered as a military genius in Islamic history, both showcase the heroic ideals of their respective traditions. Their exploits serve as historical touchstones for the martial virtues of- But it's worth mentioning here as well, of course, that Hinduism is seen as such a pacifistic, peaceful religion within the West. Nobody associates war with Hinduism. But on the other hand, here you can clearly see, of course, that there was warfare within Hinduism as well. There was warfare in Christianity. There is warfare within Buddhism. Every religion has warfare, obviously. And even secularists have warfare. If you look into the military complex, you will see a secularist organization that commits atrocities. They go to war. This is what humans do. And therefore to claim that Islam is this oh so evil warmongering religion is yet again hypocritical. Bravery and strategic Ridiculous. intelligence in both religions. Right. Aryabhata, a renowned Hindu mathematician and astronomer, made significant scientific contributions, including approximations of pi. In contrast, Al-Khwarizmi, a Persian scholar in the Islamic world, is known as the father of algebra showcasing major contributions to the field of mathematics from both cultures. The mango, used in Hindu rituals and symbolism as a sign of prosperity and love, this is really contrasts a hard with pick, dates in Islamic tradition, a fruit both. of great significance, particularly during mangoes. Ramadan, marking the breaking of fast. Right on. Many Hindus abstain from eating beef out of reverence for cows, Easy choice. while Muslims avoid pork due to dietary laws, reflecting how religious beliefs shape dietary practices in each culture. 
Sure, but worth mentioning here as well is of course that we believe that the swine is a filthy animal, a dirty animal. We do not believe that the swine is a god to us. I would say it's an important distinction here. Ganga Jal, water from the holy river Ganges in Hinduism, okay. is considered sacred and purifying. This parallels- Yeah, you have holy waters everywhere in Christianity as well. When I was a Christian, I was ignorant. I thought only Christians have holy water, but that is of course not the case. The Islamic belief in Zamzam water from a well in Mecca. Right thought to be a gift from God with healing properties, both serve as potent symbols of purification and divine blessings in their respective traditions. The ultimate goal in Hinduism is moksha, liberation from the cycle of birth and death, signifying a liberation from physical existence and merging with the divine. In contrast, Baroka in Islam refers to divine blessings or the presence of God in one's life, representing a continuous divine grace and guidance in worldly life. Yeah, that is the main difference here. Of course, in Islam, the focus is on the akhirah, the afterlife, and not the dunya, this creation. However, nevertheless, we do pray for our blessings and success in this life and in the afterlife. With Hinduism, on the other hand, it is different. They are aiming to transcend this life, to leave this creation, to leave this human body behind and get to the next realm or if they fail, they have to reincarnate again and then it is a new card deck. They're going to be a new personality. So it's not about your life. It is not about improving your life. On top of that, you of course have the caste system as well and you're kind of trapped within that paradigm. You cannot even shift further or exit that caste system that is given to you, that is ordained to you. However, in Islam, we are called five times per day to come to success. Dharma in Hinduism refers to the moral, societal and cosmic laws that guide human behavior toward living righteously and achieving right. spiritual liberation. In contrast, Sharia in Islam is the legal and moral code that guides a Muslim's behavior in all aspects of life. Although both deal with moral and ethical living, Dharma has a broader cosmic perspective, whereas Sharia provides detailed guidance on daily living. Yeah, Yoga in Hinduism, which seeks spiritual insight and tranquility through physical postures and meditation, is akin to Dikr in Islam, a devotional act involving repeated recitation of God's names. Both practices offer a path to spiritual concentration and connection with the divine, reflecting a shared emphasis on personal spiritual discipline. Yeah, I've seen many people fail on that pursuit. Unfortunately, I talked to so-called yoga masters personally, and after 20 to 30 years, they damaged their spine because of all of those postures. Yoga is sold to you as something healthy, something that will enhance your life physically and spiritually. However, I've met so many people that damage their spines forever through that. And moreover, yoga is a about the self. Of course, people will claim it is about the higher self, it is about you connecting to your higher self, etc., etc. But no matter how you phrase it, it is about yourself. In Dikr, we are remembering God. Emphasis on personal spiritual discipline. Akamana in Hinduism is a ritual cleansing process involving sipping water with mantras, symbolizing spiritual and physical purity. This parallels voodoo in Islam, a purification ritual involving washing specific parts of the body before prayer, both rituals emphasizing the importance of purity in worship. Dana, the act of giving in Hinduism, reflects the principle of generosity and selflessness. Similarly, zakat in Islam, a form of obligatory charity, embodies the principles of social responsibility and aid to the less fortunate, reflecting shared values of compassion and community support. Hindu tradition favors cremation, a ritual seen as a key part of the Couldn't journey of the different. soul, reflecting a cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. Mm. On the other hand, Islamic practices advocate for burial, aligning with the faith's emphasis on dignity and respect for the deceased. These rites showcase how each religion distinctively honors and remembers the departed. Just from a biological perspective, if you burn the body, you do not benefit anyone with it. However, if you bury somebody, the whole ecosystem can feed on that body. This is, of course, very useful for the world. These rites showcase how each religion distinctively honors and remembers the departed. In Hinduism, believes in reincarnation, the soul's journey through successive lives, in contrast with Islam's belief in resurrection, where each individual will be brought back to life for the final judgment. Right. This concludes our comparison of Hinduism and Islam. It's our sincere hope that this video can serve as an enlightening bridge enabling followers of both faiths to deepen their mutual understanding and thereby fostering an environment of greater respect and harmony. As we navigate the complexities of our world today, the call for more peace and less animosity is more crucial than ever. 
Thank you for joining us in this exploration, and don't forget to stay tuned for more insightful content in the future. All right, then. this is it for today's video. Well done, I would say. The ending, the emphasis on peace. Of course, we would agree, we all want peace, but not to the detriment of truth. When we're talking about religion, when we're talking about theology, we are talking about truth claims. And this is very important to understand because ultimately we always have a belief system in society that will dictate all of our life. If we adapt communism, we have a consequence. If we adopt a dictatorship, we have a consequence. If we would adopt anarchy, we would have a consequence as well. And therefore, if we're talking about religion, of course, nowadays people get sidetracked and they put religion on the back burner and they're all secularists, but never Nevertheless, this of course not what the religious mind believes. We do believe that our religion comes from God and therefore gives us the perfect guidance for this world, for this life and the hereafter. Every Muslim that is a true Muslim does not want to live under a democracy, does not want to live under any other system than Sharia law. Otherwise, you can't really claim that you are a Muslim if you would disagree with Sharia. And all of that being said, we believe that monotheism Tawhid, Islam, is the right path for everyone, right? So therefore, we cannot compromise here on religion. This is why I pointed out when the video spoke about the different prayers that it is not only about the external. Hey, this prayer is very rigid. This one is more loose. It's not about it. It is about the theology. One prayer encourages you to pray to one God alone. The other prayer encourages you to worship different deities. Those are completely different worldviews and will lead to different outcomes. Hindu Hinduism, as I mentioned, has a caste system. In Islam, we do not have that. Nobody is greater than anybody else. Allah is the greatest, of course. And you can only be better if you are more pious. But under God, we are equal. So this is a very different system. And therefore, it has to be pointed out, of course. And probably the most important part of the video was the mentioning of the cultural component of Hinduism. If you look into Hinduism, it is mostly Indians that are Hindu. So you cannot deny this cultural component whatsoever. However, culture is very, very tricky. I was born into an Orthodox Christian family from the Balkans. If I would have never reflected, I simply would have stayed a Christian. And I would have assumed, full of arrogance, that I am on the truth. But how would I know this? Right? I'm simply doing what my parents have done and my grandparents have done. But my great, 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 great grandparents, they were pagans. Right? Christianity got imposed onto them. So who is right here? here? How do I make an informed decision? So we can never stop questioning if we really want to find truth. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. Long enough as it is, I'm going to cut it off here. If you liked it, leave it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel via Patreon or by buying merch, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.